glad that you are here. But we're missing lots of people this morning. What's happening? It's lots of empty chairs. Is it the weather? Yeah, because the weather got my voice, got Iona's voice. So let's, let's try Iona. Let's see. Let's see if, you, if, you, if you, I can cope with it. Let's go for it. Right. Um, today, we are actually celebrating two very important moments in church. The Lord's Supper, of course, and also the reception of new members in church. We will receive Jovia officially into our membership. Jovia? Woo! Yeah. So, yeah, we're supposed to have another person, but for personal uh, 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 issues, she cannot be here this morning, but we'll, we'll have that later on, right? So, but each of these moments of each of these acts in church, right, carries a, a spiritual weight on us, right? Reminding us of our commitment to Christ with the supper and our commitment to his church as becoming a member of the church, right? So membership is a bond of commitment to the body of Christ which, uh, uh, with each member representing an essential part. That's what I want to talk about this morning, right? I want to talk about our part as the body of Christ, as member of his church, as member of his church, amen? amen. Of Christ's church, and also the reasons why we come and we share the communion together, together as his church. Therefore, today's sermon invites us to reflect on each person's role and responsibilities in the church and what it means to be an active and committed member as the scriptures teach us. And bear with me because I will be using quite different verses, right? I'm not, I'm not be juggling around, don't worry. I'll, I'll be using 1 Corinthians and Ephesians basically, but I'll, I'll be back and forwards if you like, all right? So first, 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12 from verses 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. So I'll be talking about the meaning of the membership in the body of Christ. That's my first point. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 14 says this. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul teaches us that the church is the body of Christ. Amen? The church is the body of Christ, and each Christian is a member of that body. Membership in church, then, is not a social status or a label that you put on yourself. It is a spiritual reality in your life, in the church life. When we become members, we are called to contribute to the life and mission of this body, Christ's body, understanding that no one is dispensable or insignificant. We are all important. We are all important part in this body. This image of the body illustrates for us a vital interdependence of each other. We must love each other. We must be united to each other. We must serve each other to the glory of God. That's what the, the Bible teaches us. The pastor is not more important than you. The leader is not more important than you. You are not important than me. We are all equal in, in God's eyes. And we are called together to serve together because one day we'll be all together with Christ. Amen? Amen. That's very important. That's very important to us. We, we must understand this. So Christians cannot live in isolation, cannot survive in isolation. Why? Because the reality here teaches us that we need one another to grow. We need one another to serve and to glorify God together. Becoming a church member implies commitment. 
It is a call to step out of uh, your spiritual isolation, if you like, into an active and dedicated community of life. So today, we welcome new members, or at least one new member, now in the morning, but in the evening, we'll be welcoming one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight members, eight new members to the church. Praise God for that. Three, three families, three families. Some of them, you already know, Kawan, he's been baptized, he's been preaching here, he's now off to, to, off to university. He became a member even before the, his parents. Now they bec they're, becoming a member, they're becoming members as well. So today as we welcome new members, right? Where am I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're saying yes. We saying yes, and they are saying yes to this reality, to this spiritual reality. Accepting their role and responsibility within our community. Our prayer is that we all embrace this commitment and faithfully fulfill our calling as part of the body of Christ. Beth just announced that we're having members meeting on the 15th. If you are a member of this church, you have a commitment to be here. And I'm not saying that you are obligated to be here. Because you need to be here because you love the church and you love the work that this church does for the glory of God. Because we do need to decide things together. That's one thing that I love about this. Because I do not decide everything together. Then I cannot be blamed for everything that goes wrong. <laughs> because we all decide together. But that, this is very important, my friends. This is very important. This is not one man band. We are all together in this. And we, are, and we decide everything together. And we, and we talk about this. Why? Because we want to glorify our God together. We want to serve together. So, this, the, 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 so the emphasis here is that if we are in Christ, we are all part of the body. Amen? Amen. We confess the same Lord. Amen? Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of the church. And we serve in the same body, the church of Christ. And we are baptized in the same spirit, the Holy Spirit of our God. You see, we must understand this. Because if we are in Christ, we are part of the body, the church. And we have one Lord, just one Lord, one Lord. There is no other Lord, there is no other name, there is no other God but only Christ Jesus our Lord. And there is only one spirit as well. Because people, people around there, uh, out there, they, they, they misunderstand this act of the Holy Spirit. They say, oh, I want this, I want that. No, no, there is only one. There is only one. And this is the one who works in us and transforms us. The spirit of God. So when we talk about the body, we must speak about blood. Correct? Do you understand that? Is there any doctor here? Is there any nurses here? Is there any? Yeah? Well, you don't need to be a doctor. You don't, you don't have to be a nurse to know that. If there is no blood, you, exactly, you're dead. You're dead, right? Blood is essential to keep us alive. Any part of the body where blood does not reach is dead. Blood gives life, unites, just as the blood of Christ does for the church. We are united because of the blood of Christ. We are saved because of the blood of Christ. We are alive because of the blood of Christ. He said, because of my death, you can have life. And not only life, but eternal life. But eternal life. So there is no church, and I'll, I'll say it again, there is no church outside of Christ. There is no church. Just as there is no member outside of the, of the body. Right? I told you that once. You can, see, you can see a body walking down the road without an arm, without a leg. Yes? But if you see a leg, Walking down without a body, you run away. Even though it's Halloween, you run away because there is no such a thing. Right? Why? Bec why? why sometimes you need to cut it off? Because there is no blood. There is the, 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 it's not life in there. 
you need to cut it off, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll take part or we'll, we'll come together and then you'll be dead and then they'll take everything from you. Then you need to cut off. And what do we do with it? If we go to the Bible, it says that if you are out of Christ, you put on a fire to be consumed for eternity. But if you are in Christ, if you, we are in Christ, we have life. Even though we suffer, even though we have problems, even though we, oh, tell me about that. Above everything else, we have Christ. We have Christ. So the text here speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit in all of us. Once we believe, the Holy Spirit works in us, works in us. We are grafted into the body of Christ. And we are baptized by the, by the Spirit. He brings change and transformation in our life. This is important. Membership in the body of Christ calls us to a commitment and active living. You cannot be a member of his church and not be active. You have to be active. And when I say active is living for Christ, means living for Christ. Then you're being active. I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to be running around church, you'll be running lots of things in church, doing lots of things. No, no, no. Active living means being active in Christ, living for his glory and doing his work. Amen? That's active living. Then we, we, we must be united because we are brought to life by the blood of Christ and transformed by the Holy Spirit to glorify God together. So this is my first thing, my, my, first, uh, my first point that I want to talk to you is the meaning of that. The meaning to become a member. This is important to us. It's not only signing a paper. It's not only coming to three times a year for, for our members meeting. No. It's to be united and to be active in the body of Christ. The second point that I want to discuss is that we must work unity, even though we are a very diverse community. Look around you. There is absolutely no one equal to you or that looks like you. Is there? Praise God for this. I don't know if I want another Leandro. I don't know if, even if my wife wants another Leandro. <laughs> right? So unity in diversity. And for this, we, go, we are going to read 1 Corinthians 12 from 25 to 27. Same, same uh, chapter 12, but now go down to verse 25 to 27. It says this. So that there should be no division in the body. But that is, its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it, with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Paul also speaks of unity within diversity. In Corinthians 12, he, the, the, he emphasized that although we have different gifts and roles, we are all equally important to the church. This unity, however, is only possible when there is mutual respect, honor, and care for each other. The diversity of gifts is a blessing given by God to his church. You know? This morning, my, my wife was, was w uh, watching a video from Martin Luther, the Reformation guy, if you don't know him. Not, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, the first one, right? He was in front of, of one of the high priests, and then he's, he was reading Romans, Romans 1, 17, which says, the just will live by faith alone, by faith. And then he said to the, to the high priest, he said, listen, I was reading the scriptures. 
And I understood there is no such a thing that doing good, that doing uh, good deeds or buying my inheritance in heaven or any other stuff will bring me to heaven. And then the high priest said, my friend, if you take this, if you take all of this, what else have you got? The answer was, Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ. Right? We have Jesus Christ. So the diversity is a blessing given by God to the church. This means that no one, no one should boast of their gifts or envy the gifts of others. Each of us has been chosen and equipped to contribute uniquely to the church growth. Each, of, each one of us. Each, you know, sometimes you think, oh, you know, I don't know anything. I don't know, I, you know, I can, do, I can play like Jackie. I can sing like Iona or Adrian. I can play guitar like Steve does. I can, I can speak like Pastor or Mary or, yeah, but. You have your own calling. I've got my calling. You've got your calling. So don't, don't think that you are you're not important because you are. You are important to Christ. You are so important that he went to the cross for us. Where's the cross? Oh, here. I like to point to the cross always. Sorry, I'll put it there. No problem. You know why it's important? Because there is no Christianity without the cross. People, they want to take the cross out of the picture. No, 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 Jesus didn't go to the cross. He didn't die on the cross. No, no, no. Oh, yes, he did. So there is no Christianity without the cross. As there is no church, as there is no communion table without the cross. Because everything needs to go to the cross for our salvation. That's why... It's only through Christ that we have salvation. That's only through Christ that we can be saved from this world. So brothers and sisters, we are not here to compare ourselves or to be compared to another. We are here to serve one another according to the calling. And equipping that God himself has given to each one of us. So I encourage you, when the devil or any of his messengers, you know, start putting such thoughts in your heads... Look up, look up, because it is from there that our help comes. From there that comes our equipping. And from there that Lord will return and take us with him forever. So look up. At the same time, there are, there are made uh, 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 those who think there's themselves better than and more important than the others. To them, I say, if you believe this, then you are in the wrong place. You don't belong to Christ church. You don't belong it. Because if you think that you're more important than anyone else, then you never understood what God did to us through Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, that's why I like the cross, because I keep pointing to the cross. The cross needs to be visible. Because if we think this, if you think that we are more important, then you never understood what Christ did for us on the cross. There is no place for such things in the church of Christ. The Bible is very clear when it tells us that we are all saved by the same Christ. That we are all baptized by the same spirit. And that we are all part of the same body. Therefore, we are all important. Each doing their role for the common good, for the glory of God. Receiving new members means welcoming gifts and talents that we may not even know. Although we know that Josie is a very talented singer. But there are not some other gifts maybe that we may don't know yet. And she will come up and say, yeah, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to serve this. Whoa, praise God for this. 
It is our role to support one another. And so that each member finds their place of service. Right? So don't, don't think of yourself of doing nothing in church. Because you are, you are not called to be seated on the chair. You are not called for that. You are not called to be uh, in church once a week. And you sit, and then you hear the pastor, and you say amen, and then you go home, and then you come back next week. This is not church life. And we'll talk about this later on. Now, my third point, point is our mutual responsibility and spiritual growth. Because if you are a member of his church, then you need to seek maturity in Christ. Amen? Because if you are a member of his church, that means you've been, you've been fed through his word. The Holy Spirit works in you, and then you become a new creation. Yes? So let's go for it. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 to 3. As a prisoner, a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now go down to verse 11. Same chapter 4, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to equip his people for works of service. Look, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all, not only the leaders, not only the pastors, but we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So that's what God wants for us. They want us to be mature until we have, we understand the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So Ephesians 4, 1 to 3 and 11 to 13 in this case, speaks of believers calling to live worthily which includes humbleness, gentleness, and patience. He also mentions that God gave gifts to the church for the body's growth and edification, intending to lead us to spiritual maturity. If you say that you are a Christian and you are the same thing that you were yesterday, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because we are completely different today. Even in our human nature, we are different from today, from yesterday. Because today, we are one day older than yesterday. Yeah? We are one day older than yesterday. That means we are closer to the end. We are, every day, we are closer to the end. Do you believe that? I hope you do. Because that is the truth. You're not getting any younger. None of us, none of us, we are not getting any younger. We're getting older. And as we get older, we are reaching our final destination. We will be with our Lord one day. Right? So, spiritually speaking, you're not the same as yesterday. And worldly speaking, you are not the same as yesterday. We change. We're talking here about the work of the Spirit giving us this transformation that He needs in us in order to glorify our God. The gifts are yet another manifestation of God's grace in our life. You know, God's grace is not only the grace of the salvation. Yes, it is. The grace of salvation is the greatest of all. But also the grace of God works in us, giving us giving us the gifts to promote growth for the church and for each member of his church. The word gift, the word gift was translated from the original Greek. Hold on. So the word gift was translated from the original Greek charismata, or charismata, if you like. 
and came from the word charis or charis, which means grace. Which means grace. However, this is not a saving grace. This is the grace that God poured out to his people, to equip his people to the service. Membership involves mutual responsibility. We are called to live in holiness, exhorting, encouraging, and even correcting one another in love. Who of you who will see your brother or your sister doing wrong and say nothing to them? If you just playing blind in that situation, you are completely wrong according to the Bible. Because the Bible tells us if you see your sister, if you see your brother doing wrong, you have the right to tell them you are wrong. You're going astray. That's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. And I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm telling you this because I want you to be with me in heaven. I'm telling you this because you are saved and I am saved. So if you're doing this, you are wrong. This is our responsibility. You do that to your kids. Don't you? I hope you do. If they're doing wrong, you must tell them that they're wrong. So that's what God wants us to do in his church as well. God's purpose for this church is that it grows in unity, in knowing the truth, and in becoming mature. Attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ for this, everyone must contribute and be committed to the teaching the word, to prayer and fellowship. What's the verse of the year for us? Remember? Yeah, good. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm happy you remember everything. I'll sit until you tell me. People are very clever. They're looking over there. Look. <laughs> Ephesians 4. 4. Good. Yeah, someone said it. But there are three main words to, uh, that we took from those verses, which is unity, service, and and growth. That's not exactly what, the Paul, what Paul is saying here. We need to be united. We must serve and we must grow in the knowledge of Christ. Now, let's talk about the supper. Let's talk about communion. The Lord's Supper, supper is a symbol of unity and commitment. Yes? Commitment to him and commitment to one another. Because he never said, you don't need to go to church. Jesus Christ talking to his disciples at the, at the Last Supper. Now I am going to the Father. Right? Now you go home and lock yourself in. And once in a while, you break bread and drink the wine and remember that my commitment with you. That's, that's nothing to do with Christ. He said, now I am going to my Father and you, all of you, you gather together, and then you celebrate the supper together, and remember that that's my, this is my new covenant with you. Do it until I come back. I come back. So one, go back to Corinthians now. One Corinthians now. One Corinthians ten. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks as, as a participa participation in the body of Christ? And it is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share of one loaf. So 1 Corinthians 10, 16, 17 reminds us that by partaking in the Lord's Supper, we share in one bread and one cup, representing our unity in Christ. 
our unity in Christ. That is a powerful reminder that it means to be a body of Christ and to be called to live in purity and holiness. Why? Because we keep saying that you don't, okay, let's, let's not put rules where there are no rules here. I'm not saying that you should be a Cliff Folk Church member to become or, or to be part or to, 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 to share with us communion. But, but you have to be a member of the body of Christ. You, you have to be a Christian. You must be converted to take part. That's what the Bible teaches. Because you only can take part if you understood what, what Jesus did to you on the cross. Remember the cross? Very important, because if you, not, if you don't recognize, if you don't know that our Lord Jesus Christ died for you, what's the point of taking communion? There is no point in taking communion. This is important to us. I see sometimes people taking communion just for the sake of, oh, everybody, everybody's doing it, so we'll do it. That's wrong. Because Paul in, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 says, if you're doing it, 12, sorry, if you're doing it, you bring in condemnation to yourself because you're doing wrong. The Lord's Supper is not merely a ritual. It is a celebration for, of, of our union with Christ and one another. It is a moment of self-examination. You see? Am I saved? Yes. Amen. Am I forgiven? Yes. Amen. Jesus Christ died for me? Yes. Amen. Have I done something wrong with someone? I did, so I must say sorry. Do I need to forgive someone? Yes, so I, I must forgive. And then you take communion. And Paul never said, if you have something against your brother or sister, go home and come back next month and take communion. He never said that. If you have something, you go now. You forgive now. And you ask for forgiveness now, and then come and share the table with us. This is important as well. Through the supper, through the communion, we, are rea we reaffirm our loyalty to Christ and our responsibility towards the body of Christ. In taking communion, we renew our faithfulness to the covenant of love with Christ and his church. Because we do remember what he's done for us. Not that we don't remember any, of, or any other day of the, of the month. But this is special. This is special. It is an opportunity to confess sin, to reconcile re relationships, to reaffirm our commitment to being a community of grace and truth. So now that we understood what, what is all about this membership thing, I hope you do. And now we understood who can take part in this. Now let's talk about the mission. Because we have a mission, don't we? It's not only become member. It's not only take part of the communion and then live happily forever. No. We have a mission. In Matthew 28, 19 says, Go and make disciples of all. I'm glad it's not only for the English speakers. I'm glad it's not only for the Portuguese speakers. Although English is a universal language, you can go anywhere in the world. Then, if you speak a bit, a bit of English, you'll be okay. Right? And some places, if you say you're Brazilian, you'll be okay. I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. And some places, if you say you're English, you'll be okay. And some places, if you say you're African, you'll be fine. But most places, if you say you're Christian, you'll be in trouble. You'll be in trouble. But God told us to go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, remember, there is another one. But you will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. My witness. So as a church, 
We are commissioned to be light and salt in the world. Living out and proclaiming the gospel, making disciples and expanding the kingdom of God. Are you making disciples? Are we making disciples? And let's be very clear. I'm not making disciples of myself. I'm making disciples of Christ. We need to point to Christ. I don't want people to be like me. I want people to be like Christ. I want to be like Christ. That's our goal. Each member of a local church has a vital role in this mission. Our unity and our gates converge so that we may represent Christ powerfully and visibly in our community and beyond. And beyond. So being part of the church involves a collective mission and a commitment to public witnesses. You know, I think that was Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. That's him. Because in, because in Brazil, it would just say Billy Graham. Just Billy Graham. That's him. I think he used to say this. People, they might not read the Bible, but they read your life. They want to know if you're living the Christianity that you say. They, know, they want to know that you're living the Bible that you preach. They read your life. They're watching you. They are watching you. So we must live your, your Bible. This means that our lifestyle should reflect the values and truth of the gospel in every area. At work, family, society, every member by serving in the church and developing discipling relationships. Right? So our membership is not only a commitment to one another, but also a responsibility before our God. We are called to preach the gospel and demonstrate this love in action. You see? We are not saved by the actions. But because we are saved, we demonstrate the action of love. This is something very different. We should pray that each one of us would be an ambassador of Christ in our spheres of influence. Anywhere. And now, number six, the importance of holiness and good testimony. I'm talking about Christian life here, my friends. Being a Christian is not easy. Not at all. If you think being a Christian is easy, you, again, you are in the wrong place. As members of the body of Christ, we are also called to a life of Holiness. 1 Peter 1.15 says, don't need to open, I'll read that for you. 1 Peter 1.15 says, we, uh, uh, but we, sorry, but just as we, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Because he is holy, so we must be holy too. Our conduct and testimony are fundamental to building up the body and the church impacting the world. Holiness is a reflection of the transformation that Christ did in us. I can, again, that's why I cannot say I'm the same person that I was. 22 years, 23 now, years ago, I'm not the same person as I was yesterday. You are not, because we are growing. When each church member lives according to Christ's standards, the church becomes a living testimony to the power of God to transform lives. So, as we reflect on that, it means on what it means to be the body of Christ, we are reminded that the local church is God's instrument for spiritual growth, for fellowship, and mission in the world. Each of us, as a member of this body, is called to contribute. So let's remind about the six points. Commitment to the body. May we be a church of presence and participation. Yes. Where each member finds their place 
and serve with dedication and love. Second point, unity in diversity. May we respect and value the diversity of gifts, understanding that all are needed and given for building up the church of Christ. The third, mutual responsibility and spiritual growth. May our church promote growth and spiritual maturity being a place where all seek the fullness of Christ. You know why you why you call Christian? Because right at the beginning, when they were in Macedonia, uh, Antioquia, yes, they were called the people of the way at the time. People of the way, they, they, they used to, the, the Christians used to be called people of the way, right? And then one day someone said, well, they, they talk like Christ. They live like Christ. They die for the cause of Christ. So they call them Christians. Christians means followers of Christ. Then, since then, everyone who follow Christ is called Christian. So if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, we must seek maturity. Holiness. Each member pursues life of holiness, living in such a way that our community is known for its integrity and love. Mission, commitment to the gospel. May our church be engaged in the mission of making disciples, being light and salt around the world, and demonstrating God's love and grace in action. So my friends, you see, if you're thinking of becoming a member of this church, you should read those verses again. And there is no another more important or blessed membership in the whole world rather to become a member of his church. Because when we become a member of his church, that means, first of all, that means we are saved. The most important thing. The second thing means that we want to serve in his church. And the third thing means that we, we must live the gospel that we proclaim. If you're not living the gospel that you proclaim, you're living a lie. If I am not living the gospel that I proclaim, I'm living a lie. And I'm not saying that you should be perfect because the perfect is the only one and he is Jesus Christ. But he says that we should seek maturity. So I encourage you, when you think about the church, think about those things. When you think about how to live, how, how should I live my life, think about those things. Because the one who called you is perfect, is holy. So he wants us to be holy. But not as he is holy. Don't, don't mess up this holiness thing. He wants us to live in the right way. To preach and to live. Remember, people don't read their Bible, but they read our life. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word that reminds us of the privilege and responsibility of belonging to your body, the church. Thank you for the opportunity to receive new brothers and sisters into our faith community. May each of us live in a manner worthy of the calling we have received, serving one another with humility, with humbleness and love. We ask that your Holy Spirit empower us to live in unity, celebrating the diversity of gifts you given to us, and that all find their place of service for the sake of your kingdom. Help us, Lord. Help us to live according to your will, 
as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we also remember your sacrifice and renew our covenant with you. May these acts unite us in love and commitment as one body until the day we are forever with you. May our church reflect your glory to the world and be a living testimony of your love and grace. Help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You can turn the...